Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to walk you through creating your first web service with ASP.NET Core. Okay, so I want to jump right in and create our application. But before that, we need to make sure that we have the correct Visual Studio workload downloaded and installed in order for us to use ASP.NET Core. So go to Tools, Get Tools and Features, and click Yes. And this is going to go off and load, and we want to check to make sure we have the correct workload. Now when it loads, you'll see a section called Web and Cloud, and the first workload in it is ASP.NET and Web Development. We need to have this workload downloaded and installed for us to use, as you can see, ASP.NET Core. So go ahead and click that and download it, and then you'll be good to go. So now that we have the workload, let's go ahead and create the solution and project. So we'll go to File, New, Project, and in the .NET Core section, we want to create an ASP.NET Core web application. Now you can call this whatever you want. I'll call this Hello Core. And you can choose where you want to save it. Now once you do that, you can go ahead and click OK. Now this is going to bring up a little wizard to help us choose what kind of starting code we want to have in this. Now we're going to be dealing with building a web service or web API. So we want the API. But you can use ASP.NET Core to build an MVC web application as well, which is the other common template to use, which is right here. In future videos, I'll probably do that as well. But for now, we're going to do an API application. So as you can see in the description, this template helps you create a RESTful HTTP service. So I'll go ahead and just click OK on that and create the application. Now, my goal in this video is to show you how to use ASP.NET Core to create a RESTful web service. My goal isn't to teach REST completely, but just for people that aren't familiar, I just want to give a basic rundown of a couple of important things about REST that I want to talk about. And then for anything past that, if you have questions, I'll answer them in the comments. Or if a lot of people want a full video on REST, then I'll go ahead and do that as well. Okay, so there's two different parts we need to talk about. We need to talk about REST, and then we need to talk about the web service side. And that's more specifically in HTTP web service is what we're interested in. And an HTTP web service is just a web service that uses HTTP. This means that any device or platform that has a connection to the internet can literally use an HTTP web service because you're using the infrastructure of HTTP. So for example, when you want to get data from a, from a web service, that's an HTTP web service, you would use an HTTP verb of get, just like what you would do when you're in a browser when you type www.google.com. Right? That's issuing a get request using the HTTP verbs. So REST or HTTP web services are based around HTTP verbs, which we'll get to throughout this video and upcoming videos. But let's talk about REST a little bit more. Okay, so REST stands for Representational State Transfer. And first and foremost, you need to understand that REST is an architectural style. Think of it as guidelines or standards or rules about how computer systems should communicate on the internet or on the web efficiently and easily. So that's it. REST is just guidelines. It just defines a good way to develop an HTTP web service to allow it to be efficient and to easily work with others. This means that you can have an HTTP web service that is not RESTful, that's not following the guidelines of REST, and it will still work, you can still communicate with it, but not following the guidelines is not the best idea because it makes it more difficult to interact with that service, especially if you don't own that service. For example, if you're trying to use a web service that's defined by another company and you're trying to implement it yourself, if it's not following REST, then it will be difficult to interact with because now you have no standards. You don't know how to communicate efficiently and properly. And REST is, is just those standards. Now, in the REST architectural guideline, there are a bunch of what we call constraints or characteristics. And we're not going to go through them all because, like I said, I, I expect you to know this already. I'm just kind of giving a brief overview. But there are two characteristics that I want to point out as being important. 
Okay, so the first constraint that I want to talk about um, with the REST guidelines is that the server and the client should always be independent. That means that there's no restriction or dependency between the server and the client. And the client will just use URLs to understand the service. And this means that the code for the web service on the server can easily be modified without ever caring about the clients because it doesn't matter. We can modify them both independently. So this kind of separation really helps the client and server breathe freely or be independent. This allows that the, the client, so the user of the REST service, to be built using any client-side programming language or any UI language. It doesn't matter how it's implemented. All that matters is that we communicate with the REST service using a URL. Now, the only constraint that we will have between the client and the server is essentially the data that's flowing between them. And by separating the client and server and making them independent, we need to have that one condition. So the server and the client need to be on agreement as to what type of data are we sending back and forth? The f like what type of format will the data be? Will it be JSON? Will it be XML or vice versa? So with this architecture, you can really start to see how powerful it can be. Using a REST-based web service, you can put all of your business logic and your data layer up in that REST service and any client, no matter what programming language or what device it's on, desktop, mobile, whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as it can communicate over HTTP, it can communicate with this REST server and all of that business logic and data can be shared across all these different devices, which is really amazing. Now, the last constraint that I'm going to talk about in this video is the idea of statelessness. So by the REST definition, REST systems are stateless. And this means that the server does not need to know anything about the client's state or vice versa. I mean, the client doesn't need to know about the server state. This means that every single request that a client makes to the service is completely standalone and independent. And it needs to have all of the required information for the service to be successful. Meaning this, if, if I make two calls, the first call does something in the service and the second call is going to build from that. Using REST, we can't do that. We can't have the service just remember what the first operation did and then build on the second operation. Each operation from the client to the service needs to be completely packaged with all the necessary information for the service to complete its job. Now, this has a lot of benefits, and the biggest benefit is scalability. If you think about it, if your service does not need to worry about managing state or remembering anything about the client, then it can scale very easily. You're essentially just serving, the service serves the client on a per request basis, and it can handle the request in its entirety with, the, with, with that one request. So this means that if I was hosting this on some type of cloud infrastructure and I was getting a lot of requests, I can simply scale that application across multiple instances and it can, since there's no state being managed between all those instances, everything will work well. A request comes in, it can find an available instance to operate on it, and that request has everything the service needs. So it's like a complete package it can process and doesn't need to have any reference or any state information. This is really powerful. All right, so that's it for the REST conversation. Let's move on and let's actually just create our first ASP.NET Core web service. So in this start template, some magical things have happened. We get a folder called controllers and inside of it, we have a controller called the values controller. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up and we'll go through this a decent amount in this video in the upcoming videos, but I want to get started with a couple of things. Now, the first thing you may notice if you have experience with ASP.NET or sorry, ASP.NET just the, the, the older framework. Um, if you remember from that, dealing with web API, this used to derive from API controller, 
but no longer with ASP.NET Core, both building MVC applications or MVC web applications or web API applications. They both extend from controller. Now, this controller base is a little bit interesting. This is just because we're using controller base and it's a base, as you can see, it says a base class for an MVC controller without view support, meaning that we're not rendering in a, any views. If we wanted to render views, this would just be control. So before I go through some of this code, let's just go ahead and run the application. So. I'm going to go ahead and hit F5 or the play button and start up this application. Now, when it starts up, it launches my web browser and it has a URL, it has a local host, it has a port, and it has slash API slash values, and it returns value one and value two. So there's some interesting things that we need to go through here. So first you can see it says values. Well, API then slash values. So if you look here on line nine, it says route API slash, then in square brackets says controller. Now what this is saying is saying the route to this controller is the formula of API slash, and then the name of the controller. Now, if you look at the name of controller, it's actually values controller, but that's just a naming convention. Whenever you build a controller, you always want to add controller to the end of it. The real name of this controller is values. So that's why I say API slash values. Okay, so that's how the URL is working. That's how we know we get to this controller. But how are we getting this data? So as you can see, by just scanning this code, I can see that value one and value two is in this method. So I know it's coming from here, just using deductive reasoning. So let's see, let me just have these side by side. So that's annoying. Okay. So as you can see, we have a method called get, and it has an attribute called HTTP get. So this is the first HTTP verb that I want to talk about. We'll talk about more in upcoming videos, but get is the simplest HTTP verb. And what it says is it says, go to a resource at a URL and get whatever is there. So retrieve, this is the most common HTTP verb, and this will be used to even, for example, deal with websites. So when we go to google.com, we're doing a get at that URL, and it gets us the HTML that's stored there. So in this example, we're, we now know by using the browser and we type in a URL, we do a get request. But what is actually determining the get request? Is it this HTTP get? or is it the word get here? And this is kind of interesting. So let's do a little bit of a test here. Let's go ahead and copy this. I'll just copy there and I'll paste it here. And let's comment out the HTTP gets. And I'll make this one get two, okay? And I'll run the application again. Let's see what happens. So the application starts. And I get an error and it says there's multiple actions matched and it basically doesn't know I'm doing a get request here and it can't determine do I want get or get to that's interesting if I comment this back out and run it again let's see what happens and as you can see I am getting a value now so what's happening there is HTTP get by putting the attribute that takes precedence. So it will first scan the controller for anything that has attributes. If it doesn't, then what it uses next is it uses it will. So for a get request, if it sees no HTTP get, it will use whatever method is there. So for example, if there is no HTTP get again, and I'll delete this one and I'll call this test, for example. So it's not even called get. The word get is completely gone. It will still be able to determine this is the method I should do. There you go, value one and value two. Now, general rule of thumb for building a web service, you should always add your attributes. Just so it's very clear as to what is each HTTP verb. I'll change this back to get. All right, so we just did our little demo we sent a get request to the values controller, and we now sort of understand how 
we are saying we want to execute this if a get request comes to this controller using that HTTP get attribute. Great, but let's go a little bit deeper. Let's examine exactly how the client is sending the request and how it receives its response after the service processed it. So a REST request normally consists of four different pieces. It has the HTTP verb. So this is what's indicating what type of operation we're trying to perform. So remember, a GET is getting information from the service. We'll talk about the other ones in a, in a second. Then we have the header. And the header allows the client to pass additional information about the request, which we'll see as well. So if the client needs to add some more information about what this request is about, it could put some things in the header. Then we have the URL. The URL is the path to the resource that we're trying to operate on. So this is, in our case, this was API slash uh, values. And that, that was our resource there. So this is the path to the resource that we're trying to operate on. And finally, there's the body. And the body can contain um, additional extra data to help identify or update the resource. But this is optional, and it depends if you need that. You can see by scrolling down, though, when we get to post and put, it says from body. And I'll talk about that in, a, in an upcoming video. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this video is just the four HTTP verbs that we use most often. And I'm not going to go through them completely. In the upcoming videos, I'll talk about each four. I'll have a separate video covering each four. And then we'll obviously go deeper and deeper and we'll keep on going throughout ASP.NET Core. Um, so what are the verbs? We have get. So get is used to retrieve data at a resource. And we'll do that by some type of identity factor sometimes, or we're looking just to get a collection of resources. Like for example, in our first get, we're trying to retrieve a collection. So we're saying get us value one and value two. We're saying get everything at this URL. Whereas line 22 is an example of a get, but for a specific resource. And we're passing in the ID of that resource. And we'll talk about this one more in the next video. Then we have the post. Post is used to create or insert a new resource. So this is when you want to add something to your data sets or your database or whatever you're doing, whatever is behind the scenes of this service. This is to add or create a new resource. Put is used to update a resource, which this can get a little bit confusing um, with posts. So posts and put are a little bit confusing. And we'll talk about that when we get into those videos. And then finally, delete is used to remove a resource. And we'll normally um, figure that out by some type of identity. So as you can see here, we have an int ID again. So we'll talk about these in more detail in the upcoming videos. I just wanted you to create your first ASP.NET Core web API application.